right. When, uh, when LaDonna and I were quite early in, our, in that very, very long period of life that we call middle age, we're still there, right? Uh, we bought a new house. Well, I mean, it was new to us. And we decided that before we settled in it, it needed a fresh coat of paint. With this very short window of time, so we took it on with gusto. And uh, just as we were getting started, LaDonna was standing on a chair. I know, I told her it was a bad idea. She fell down off the chair, straight down, badly injured her ankle, and incapacitated her for several days. Several hours later, that same day, my mother, who was in her late 70s and lived 100 kilometers down the road in a small town, she called and said, I I just wanted someone to know I was okay. I said, what? (laughs) She'd been carrying two cookie sheets stacked with jars of fresh jam that she had made, stacked on top of each other, two tiers, and she had fallen down two steps with the jam on top of her, (laughs) laying on the garage floor. She lay there for a minute, and she was afraid to move because she was sure she had broken her hip. When she finally tried to move, it felt okay, so she got up, went back to work. But she just had to call me to let me know she was okay. Now, the complicating factor was that LaDonna and I had promised to go out to her place the next evening to help her host a dinner for a fairly large group of people. It was like... Mom, at your age, you should not be doing this by yourself. And so we, we still went. I helped my mother as young LaDonna sat in a recliner with her feet elevated and her ankle wrapped while my mother bustled around as if she was a young one and nothing had happened. At one point, LaDonna made a comment to, the effect, or to, to that effect, and then she said, so what's wrong with this picture? And my mother said to her, oh, LaDonna, you just need to learn to roll when you fall. Uh, yeah, she was shaped in a way that made rolling a little more natural than LaDonna. But it, it's become a family slogan. You just need to learn to roll when you fall. So how do you fall? Do you go down well? We all go down at times. We're taken down with no fault of our own, or we accidentally fall or we may intentionally take a path that leads us down. Or sometimes we just drift along, let ourselves go. In which direction does everything flow? Down. But are we learning to do down well? We're back this week in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Turn there. Book of Jonah. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab your um, smartphone and look up Bible.com and download um, or even just look at either the New International Version or the English Standard Version in there. And uh, Jonah, the book of Jonah, J-O-N-A-H, chapter 2. And the central question this chapter forces us to think about is how am I doing down with God? What does downtime with God look like? So where did we leave Jonah? We left him, actually, chapter 1, verse 16, in midair, on his way down into the cold, dark sea. It's been very clear from how it's recorded that Jonah's direction, remember, from chapter 1, has been all about down. He went down. It's a big word in chapter 1. He went down to Joppa instead of going up to Nineveh. He went down to the ship. He went down into the belly of the ship. In verse 5, that word, he went into a deep sleep, it's a word that rhymes with down. And then finally, after the storm came and the sailors had pinned him as the one that was the cause of this, he says, cast me down into the sea. It's what I deserve. The author of this story could have written every one of those lines without using the word down. But he not only used it once, he describes it, he uses it to describe Jonah's every single move. Down. The sailors don't want to throw him overboard because they're scared Jonah's God will turn on them. 
but they know that if they don't do it, they'll die. And so they decide to risk it. But first, verse 14 of chapter 1, they pray to Jonah's God, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not, us, lay not on us this innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done what you pleased. And then in chapter 15, the scene ends by saying they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. There's an awful lot of hurling going on in this story. God hurls a wind. They hurl Jonah overboard. There's more hurling to come. Scene one ends with this editorial comment that sort of ties up one of the threads of the story, which we have to read because it's really important for today's episode. Chapter 1, verse 16, then the men really, genuinely, authentically feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to Him. These sailors have an authentic encounter with Jonah's God. Remember that line. It would almost seem as if the story could actually end there with a big lesson. You better go obey God or else you're going to be toast right? Even in our disobedience, God wins. But, as we know, that's not the end of the story. Jonah thinks it's over. He knows he deserves it to be over, and he's getting what he deserves, but God refuses to leave it there, and he pulls off one of the greatest search and rescue dramas in all of history, Jonah and the whale. Well, Jonah in the whale, or whatever it was. Chapter 1, verse 17 is actually where the second episode begins, and we're going to see why later. Chapter 1, verse 16, and the Lord appointed, or verse 17, appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And the question is, how will Jonah do down? Will he do it well? The first thing we see is that in spite of Jonah's direct and persistent disobedience, God still cares about Jonah. Jonah has given up. He's given up obeying and following God. He'd rather die than do what he knows God wants him to do. We're talking one stubborn man. You know any of those? Did you see one in the mirror this morning? The only thing good we can say about Jonah at this point is that at least he's not willing to take others down with him. Cast me down and you will be saved, he says. And he's right, they were. But in his relentless love, God refuses to give up on Jonah. He still cares for this one wayward prophet. There's probably some of us here today who are in that place or or at the edge of being at that place. Perhaps we've taken a direction that we know is contrary to God's will. We're vacillating in our hearts and minds between two extremes. God's judging me or the other extreme, God is a God of love so He'd never judge me. Or like we saw in chapter 1, our logic is, is what we call stuck logic. I believe God wants what's best for me. I know what's best for me. Ergo, God will want for me what I want for me, right? And we're allowing our thinking to be solidified into whatever. Just throw me overboard. I don't care. But God still cares. So even as this episode begins, we need to know that just because we give up on God or even deliberately go against God, He is not giving up on us. Even though Jonah deliberately chooses down, God is going to amazingly great lengths to bring Jonah back up. But that doesn't mean God will just decide to see things our way. This morning as we work through this downtime with God experience, we're going to ask two big questions that I I think it's inviting us to ask about doing down well. Allowing God to pick us up when down is where we've gone. Number one, how does God, in his mercy and grace, bring Jonah back? And number two, does Jonah really come back 
authentically come back? Does he cooperate with God as God brings him back? And because Jonah was the book that was read out loud at the greatest festival of the year of God's Old Testament people, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and because at various points the reader would stop and the people would say, we are Jonah. And because we are coming up to the time of the year when we celebrate the fulfillment of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, we need to personalize those questions. How is God trying to bring me back? Am I cooperating with God as he offers to bring me back up? So think about those two questions. We'll leave them on the screen as we read our episode for today, beginning at Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me, and then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it puked Jonah out upon the dry land. So, how does God bring Jonah back? Well, duh, it's all about the fish, right? Well, sort of. We'll talk about that. But before we do, we need to talk briefly about the elephant in the room here. Did this really happen? Was there literally a whale or a big fish or some kind of sea creature that actually swallowed Jonah up? Can I really believe that? And of course, could... Could Jonah have stayed alive for three dates and three nights in a big fish? Well, let me just make three brief comments about that. Number one, this account is presented as literal. As we saw in chapter one, Jonah was introduced as a literal person, a son of Amittai. They could have, they could have done the historical records and seen his name there. And there is nothing about this account that would lead us to believe it is supposed to be read like a parable. The fish story is as literal as a storm story. Number two, so how am I supposed to believe that? Well, let's, let's fast forward about 800 plus years. If I believe that Jesus actually spent three days and three nights, like Jonah, in the heart of the earth, in the grave, literally died, and that God literally raised him from the dead, can I not believe that God could have made this happen? Especially when Jesus very clearly says that Jonah's story is a foreshadowing of his story. Number two, I can't see that it adds anything to try to prove that there is a fish somewhere that could swallow a human, to try to demonstrate it's biologically possible to stay alive in the belly of a whale. You see, the, the whole point of this thing is it's a miracle, which God can do. So let's get back to the question this story is wanting us to ask. How does God bring Jonah back? Okay, it's a fish, but why a fish? Would it not have made more sense? Would it not have given some continuity and some symmetry to the story if, if God had taken that wind that he hurled at the sea and just cranked one dial up a notch and with another one focused the wind a bit more and just swooped Jonah up just as he hits the water and whisked him off to dry land? He could have done that, right? So why the fish? 
What's God doing with the fish? The fish really is important in what God is doing to bring Jonah back up. And to see that, we got to look carefully at the words Jonah uses to describe his fish experience. What does it say? Verse 2, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. Verse 3, you hurled me into the depths, into the heart of the seas. The sailors hurled Jonah into the sea, but the way Jonah sees is God uses the fish to hurl him into the depths, the heart of the sea. Verse 5, the deep surrounded me. In verse 6, which is the turning point of the chapter, verse 6 says, to the roots of the mountains, the very bottom of the sea, I sank down. So what's God doing with the fish? It's very clear in the way Jonah's experience is recorded. God is taking Jonah down, all the way down. It's like God is saying to him, Jonah, you want to go down? Okay, let's do down. How does God bring Jonah back? To bring Jonah back, God has to take Jonah down, all the way down even further than Jonah went on his own. Is God sending you some downtime? Taking you into some downtime? Downtime with God is not necessarily about some fancy spiritual pamper yourself spa retreat. Oh, it is a retreat. And it does restore. But not necessarily in a pampering kind of way. Doing down with God is humbling. It often involves taking down the scaffolds that we have built to prop ourselves up. Doing down with God can be disorienting before it's reorienting. How are you doing down? The sea creature is not portrayed as simply being God's way out of the water or even as a safe place in the water. We know that Jonah is to see this partially as a sign of God's judgment, God's corrective judgment, preserving judgment, but it's, it's more than just correction and preserving, it is judgment. We know that right from the get-go because of what the story says the fish did. What does it say? It says, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, when the people of God's story, who knew God's story, When they heard that word, they would have known that this was not a good thing. Swallow is a word they knew well. Outside of the book of Jonah, this word is used 38 times in the story of God's Old Testament people, and it is always used, always in the sense of experiencing a negative consequence of some action. Let's just look at at, at their central, their, their guiding story, which was the great exodus from Egypt, right? Exodus chapter 7, verse 12, in a dramatic demonstration before the great Pharaoh of Egypt, it says that Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods of Pharaoh's magicians. Exodus chapter 15, verse 12, the Red Sea swallowed up the Egyptians. In Numbers 16, verse 20, it describes an incident that's referred to several times in the Old Testament as a warning, how the earth separated and swallowed up those leaders that rebelled against Moses. When the people heard the story of Jonah, that he was swallowed up, their first reaction would not have been, Phew, he's safe. It would have been, uh-oh, he's done. In having the whale swallow Jonah, God is setting the stage for a reminder to his people. You want to go down? God won't stop you. God might just let it happen, and God might in order to not prolong this whole thing, God might just allow you to go down further. He might even take you there. And it won't necessarily feel good. Do you have a problem with a God who does that? What are some of the things we say when, when God takes us down? How can this be happening to me? This is not fair. 
if this is what a good God does, do I really want God, right? But here's the other side of that. Almost every great leader for God in their story was first taken down by God. Moses, Abraham, King David, we saw last year. All of them did downtime. And how about Jacob? Jacob was a classic. The taking down process for Jacob took a long time. He was forced to run from his home. He endured years of mistreatment from his father-in-law. He's finally forced into a face-to-face encounter with the brother that he had screwed big time. On the eve of that meeting with his brother, the eve before that meeting, Jacob encounters God. And it's not a pump him up for the big game encounter. It's an all-night wrestling match, literally until the angel, or was it God himself, touched him on a hip, on his hip, and takes him down, giving him a limp from which he never recovered. And now Jacob is ready. Why does God take us down? God takes us down to help us to see that down, truly down, humble, transparent before God is the new up. With God, under God, the last step down is the first step up. Paul expresses that in his own experience, and he says, I will boast about my weakness because your strength is perfected in and through me, through my weakness. The book of Philippians 2, as you know, one of my favorite passages where Jesus goes down, 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 finally all the way down, completely, to die for us. And then God lifts him up. And because Jesus did down for you every single down that God takes you into, if you use it to really be down, is the first step up with God. Are you doing down well? Down is not a bad thing in the big picture if we allow down to bring us back to God, to come under God, to come into the realm of God's love and life. Any way that you can look at your life and see that maybe God is taking you on this journey down and you're fighting it, Folks, he's inviting you to let go, to give up, to surrender into his story. Although you can't see it yet, it's a much better story than you've been writing for yourself. I don't know about your journey, but there are plenty of times in my life where God has put me in places of down. Some I can see how he was saying, okay, if that's what you want, I'll let you go and experience the consequences of it. Let's, let's do some down. Others try as I might. I don't think I deserved it, but whether I deserved it or not. And it's healthy to process that well. But whether we deserve it or not, down before God, down with God, down under God is the only place where true up begins. And so God takes Jonah down to help him see that going away from God will always result in a down that is much farther than we intended And to help Jonah process that going down before God, submitting to him, giving in to him with a whole heart is the place where up begins. Are you learning to do down well? Which leads to the second question. Does Jonah do down well? How does he do down? Does Jonah cooperate with God as God takes him down? In his down, does he truly come back to God, to the heart of God, to the will of God? Now remember, as we looked at chapter 1, we saw what Jonah's struggle really was. What was it? Jonah's struggle is that what God wants for Jonah is not what Jonah wants God to want for Jonah, which is my fear, right? (laughs) And the measure of whether Jonah comes back is whether Jonah will submit with a glad heart to the will of God. 
So in this three-day, tight, dark, smelly prison, is that what happens? We're going to read it again. And as we read it, ask yourself two questions. What is it that Jonah does right? Number one. And number two, are there any clues that there might be something just a little off? Is Jonah truly going down in his heart? Is Jonah truly returning to what God wants for Jonah? Let's read it, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, am I, be, or I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life, my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So what does Jonah do right? Well, under the water, Jonah finally do, does what the pagan sailors have begged him to do, but he would not. Remember chapter 1, verse 6, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Jonah knows that to call on God means he'll have to agree with God, and he'd rather die. But now, under the water, Jonah suddenly comes to the point of realizing, I really don't want to die. And he says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Jonah finally prays, okay? Check. Maybe a little late, but, but he does it. And Jonah does another thing right. As he goes on recording in his journal, he comes back to the Word of God. He goes to God's Word. He uses the Word of God that he knows very well, mostly quotations from the book of Psalms, to compose this psalm of his own. This journal entry of Jonah's is written like a psalm. Actually, it quotes from, from at least seven different psalms in the Bible. Jonah has run from the Word of God, and now he turns back to the Word of God. And that's a good thing, right? Read your Bible. Pray, magic formula. Jonah's back on track. Or is he? It might be easy to think that this is a good prayer because God answers it. The way Jonah wants it answered. But is it really as simple as that? Maybe not. It would be easy to think that this is a good prayer because it quotes from the Bible. But let's take a little closer, a closer look at how Jonah quotes from the Bible and how Jonah prays. As we look at it more closely, well, I like the way one Bible teacher puts it. He says, I have come to see that Jonah's psalm, his prayer, is like I see a three-inch snowfall on a garbage dump. It looks beautiful until you just begin to stir around a little. So let's, let's stir around a little. Let's start with the way Jonah begins this prayer. It's his first quote, Bible quote from Psalm 120. What does Jonah say? I called out of my distress, literally out of my tightness, that's the word, really good word for Jonah, out of my tightness, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Well, that sounds pretty authentic, doesn't it? Well, if you've studied other languages, or perhaps you speak another language, you'll know that different language use, languages use different techniques to emphasize things. In the English language, sentence structure is, is pretty predictable. There's a subject, a verb, a direct object, and an indirect object. Just sort of the classic structure in English, right? But in the Hebrew language, you can change the word order any way you want in the sentence. And it still makes sense. 
Not that it doesn't matter. It does matter. You actually use word order to emphasize things. The most significant thing, the thing you want to emphasize, you put at the beginning of the sentence. Now, with that little grammar lesson, let's look again at how Jonah quotes this statement from the psalmist. Jonah says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. That's, that's literally the, the order in, the, in, in his psalm in the Hebrew Bible. But how does the psalm that he's quoting really read? To the Lord in my distress I called. The difference may seem subtle, but in the Hebrew language, it is less subtle. He changes it to emphasize himself and his response, and then God. Uh, Jonah, are you perhaps trying to make yourself look a little better? And that's just the first line. If you compare this beautiful psalm of Jonah's to the real psalm in the Bible, it's not hard to see that Jonah's Psalm is very me-centered. My distress, my dilemma, my danger, my deliverance, my delight. The real psalms are much more God-centered. They move from me to God very quickly, and mostly they start with God. Oh, yes, the whale is God providing for you, but what is God providing? What Jonah sees is that the whale is providing a way out of his distress, And he uses God's word to so beautifully say that. But Jonah, let's talk about the word of God. What about the word of God that you should be thinking about? Are you making yourself look too good? What is the word of God Jonah should be thinking about? Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. How do we use and think about God's words? So often we use God's words to make ourselves look good. So often it's all about just being able to use the right words in the right context. Did it. A number of years ago I was having coffee at the office of one of the core leaders of the church I was in at the time, and he was the director of a large government agency in northern BC, and he he liked me coming to his office occasionally because he wanted his staff to get to know me. I guess somehow he felt it would be a bridge to inviting them to church. Like, see, if there's hope for this guy, (laughs) there's hope for you, right? So there, there came a time when he invited his secretary, whom I'd gotten to know a bit, and her husband to this Christmas event at our church, and she was really warm to it. He, (laughs) not so much. I'd been warned. In the course of the evening, I walked past the table at which they were sitting, and she said with this big, warm smile, hey, and then she said, I'd like you to meet my husband. Now, I've been observing him, and he had a very definite, this is the last place I want to be look on his face. It was written all over him that I was probably the last guy he wanted to meet. But he did the polite thing. He stood up and very stiffly reached out his hand, uh, as if even touching my hand might poison him. He said, hi, I'm Devin. And then with this tone of voice that was uh, nervous maybe, a little bit lighthearted, sarcastic maybe, trying to be funny and identify with this pastor maybe, he said, Devin, you should remember that, rhymes with heaven. And his demeanor changed. It was like scored. Something just came over me like it sometimes does, and it came out of my mouth before it took a couple of trips around my head, and I said, hmm, hmm. Not sure we want to go there. My name's Mel. <laughs> the reason I, I think about that is it's so easy to think that doing, <laughs> yeah, some of you just got it. <laughs> um, th- that it, it, it's, it's so easy that to think that doing is all, God is all about just learning the right words. One big reason people who have never been to church or before are afraid to go to church is simply that they're afraid they'll be busted because they don't know the right words. But God is more concerned about those who know the words and just use it to make themselves look good and feel good. And the reason others think that church is irrelevant is because God's people they have been exposed to tend to make it all about religious words, but their attitudes and their behaviors are no different. 
And religious words simply become mantras, which become smoke screeds to hide behind. They become like, well, Jesus put it, well, he said things we use to make the outside of the cup look pretty good, but inside it's pretty dirty. Jonah knows the right words. And he uses the words to make himself look good, to deflect from real authenticity before God. Jonah, are you dealing with your issue that what God wants for you is not what you want God to want for you? So let's stir it up a little bit more. Perhaps the most powerful statement in the book is the way Jonah wraps up his prayer. Verse 9 of chapter 2. Those who cling to worthless idols forsake the hope of steadfast love. It's that word chesed, which is the most famous word about the faithful, loyal, always there love of God. And the response that I need to make to a faithful God. But I, he says, with a song of self-thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Powerful statement, isn't it? Some have said that last line is a one-sentence summary of the entire Old Testament. Salvation belongs to. Salvation comes from the Lord. That's what God does. Can you see what Jonah is doing in the context of this story? In his religious self-righteousness, Jonah is saying, see, I'm so much better than those pagan sailors who clung to and called out to worthless idols. And what does Jonah say? I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Now remember, Jonah has no idea how the sailors process the stilling of the storm. He was in the sea. What does it say they did? They offered a sacrifice to God and made vows to the Lord. Jonah's trying to make himself look good, but he's really just making himself look pretty self-righteous. And who else is clinging to worthless idols that is on Jonah's mind? Oh, the people of Nineveh to whom he was called are clinging to worthless idols. Is Jonah perhaps reminding God of why it is he doesn't want to go to Nineveh? Let's go back to Jonah's statement, what I have vowed I will make good. What has Jonah vowed? Well, we're going to to come back to that in a few minutes here. No, let's let's do it right now. where, Where does Jonah say he was going? He's no longer running away to Tarshish. In a very pious-sounding way, Jonah, twice in this poem, he says, I will look again. I'll point myself to your holy temple. I'm going back to church. I can hardly wait to get back to church. That's what Jonah has vowed. But Jonah, you have a very clear word from the Lord as to where he he wants you to go, and it's not to church to the temple in Jerusalem. Jonah, you're supposed to be going to Nineveh. What about making that vow? Jonah is trying to make it look like he's turned around without really turning around, like he's come back when he's not really come back, and he's using God's Word to do it. Speaking of the Psalms, the Word of God that Jonah is quoting, can you think of a psalm God might just be waiting for Jonah to quote. I think I can. Psalm of David, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your chesed, your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of the Lord are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Does not that sound like a perfect psalm for Jonah? to have been quoting. But Jonah never once 
never once in this prayer said, I was wrong. Jonah's thinking fits very well with the way we want to think. The way we want to think is, well, there's no such thing as a detour. It's just all a winding road. That's not true. Jonah, do you really think God is happy with what you've just said? The question we have as we end the chapter is, has Jonah budged even one inch from his self-righteousness? We don't really like the answer to that because, yeah, we are Jonah, right? Now, if you've grown up on the Jonah story, you might be saying, Mel, really? Is this how you're supposed to be reading this chapter, this prayer of Jonah? Let's just take one more line of evidence before we wrap it up. Where did we start? The beginning of this episode started by a great fish swallowing Jonah up. Protection, yes, but protection in a prison it's an experience of corrective judgment. Swallow is not a good thing. It's certainly not, okay, Jonah, it's all going to be good. And then we have Jonah's pious prayer psalm. And how does this chapter end? Verse 10, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. Yeah, we're back to hurling. Just like swallowing Vomiting in the Bible is not a good thing. In both of the Old and New Testaments, vomiting is a sign of God's judgment. And in the last letter of the Bible, it's a church to which God says, I would like to vomit you out of my mouth. It's like God is saying, oh, Jonah, 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 I've kept you alive when you deserve to be dead. I've been more gracious to you than you deserve, and you still cannot extend the grace that I've given to you to the people that I've called you to declare it. As I read Jonah's prayer and realize that they would be reading Jonah's prayer in about a week or two, I think I have a little greater insight into Jesus' encounter with some of the Jonas of his day. Remember the parable about the publican and the Pharisee praying? They had said, we are Jonah many times in their day of atonement ceremony. It again in a couple of weeks. Luke chapter 18, listen to what it says and think, Jonah. Which prayer? is Jonah's most like. Jesus told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men, he said, went up to the temple to pray. What does Jonah say? He was going up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I got. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and simply said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, said Jesus, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Which prayer is Jonah's more like? It's a prayer of the Pharisee, right? It is not the prayer of a heart that wants to share God's heart. Some of us feel we don't even know enough to be on the inside with God. We don't know the right words. We don't know all of God's words. All we need to know is that there is a God who in Jesus has come to pursue us. He has come down. He's broken every barrier between you and God, and he invites you to be his. You don't need the right words. As a matter of fact, sometimes those who have the right words become the barrier. Clearly, the way this book is written, what God wants is not for Jonah to go to church. 
very self-righteously, Jonah has said, okay, God, no more running. I'm going back to the temple. God might not be able to direct Jonah, but he can direct the fish. The fish goes where God tells it to go. It goes to pick Jonah up. And the way I read the story, I may be reading into it a little bit, but I believe the fish, under God's direction, takes Jonah and pukes him up on the shore that is closest to Nineveh. Yes, God is a God of grace. He is a God of grace to rank pagans who don't believe in Him, but perhaps even more amazing, He is a God who continues to extend His grace to Jonah's, who have know everything about Him, but who are making it all about themselves, and He's inviting us to come back all the way back. And so in the spirit of using this book like God's people in Jesus' day were using this book, getting ready for the celebration of the Day of Atonement, of, of Calvary, how they would pause and say, we are Jonah. Let, let's, let's just ask as we close a few how might I be Jonah questions. Number one, is there a down place God is taking you and all you are doing is begging and demanding that He get you out of there? How is it he might want to meet you there? Perhaps even take you a little further down to learn more about yourself. One of the lines I love, and I'm sure I've quoted it before, that a Christian is one who gives that part of herself or himself that they know to that part of God that they know. Growing is simply being willing to learn more of myself, and sometimes that involves going down so that I can learn more about how great and good God is. Sometimes down is the place God is inviting me to learn more about myself and about Him. God does not want my promises. He wants from me a prostrate heart, a broken and a contrite heart you will not despise. Second, can I accept from God what Many people have called a severe mercy. The book of Lamentations says, by His mercy we are not consumed. He's talking to God's people. Any way that I need to shift my perspective from deserve what I think I deserve to seeing how God is actually preserving me, it's not about what I deserve or don't deserve. It's about how God in His mercy is still preserving me through what I'm experiencing. Is that, is that how I'm seeing it? Number three, how might I be using God's words to hide a disobedient heart, to avoid something about God's word I know I need to obey? One of the main through lines of the Bible is about people who use religious words to, bat and to mask rebellious hearts. We use God language to hide our true heart and to fuel our self-centered hearts. Is, is there any way you can see that you're doing that? Number four, am I all about God's mercy for me, to me, and not about God's mercy through me to others? Number five, Am I willing to meet Jesus where he calls me to meet him? Down at the foot of the cross. That is always where up begins. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God of all grace and mercy, we confess that we tend to presume on your grace rather than moving with and passing on your grace to others. We confess that we use your word that we want to use to make ourselves look good rather than allowing your word to expose us for our good. Create in us clean hearts. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Grant us willing spirits to keep on moving with you. And as we give ourselves to delighting in you and you, your word, we pray that you will unite us in delighting in your will together. We will give ourselves together to passing on the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.